um, uh, thank you for the people to, who are here. Uh, first, I must say I'm not a neurologist, but a uh, neuropsychologist. And I am uh, speaking about uh, interest and limits in evaluation of cognitive disorder for the elderly. In introduction, why this question interests psychologists? Populations aging is a public health issue and dementia for the elderly a reality. Examination of cognitive disorders for the elderly are done to help them to have the better aging possible in spite of Alzheimer's disease and relative disorders, Parkinson's disease, psychiatric and or addictive disorders, and also to reassure people with no cognitive troubles to prevent pathological aging. But the way to do it is what's the most important, taking care of each subject in its own history. Who is requesting it? It can be either a subject who comes by himself with a complaint of memory, most often, or a family which is in difficulties with an old relative, or a general practitioner or hospital MD, or a care provider in institution for the elderly. How, it is, how is it done? We begin first with interview using minimal state examination or MOCA test with a doctor qualified in gerontology and neuropsychology who work with a neuropsychologist to have an idea of the complaint. And then we trust the history of the patient, medical and psychological, with question of the person's bi biography. Let's see what data I required. Patients and caregivers self-questionnaire if someone of the family is present. Imaging, MRI scan, functional MRI. Cerebrospinal fluid markers. Neuropsychology assessment. Memory, language, executive function, apraxia, agnosia, autonomy, and eventually trouble of behavior. Also, depression state using DSM-5 or ICD-10 criteria. I would like to say a few words about the specificity of consultation in institutions for the elderly. Firstly, it's necessary to provide a, pre a preliminary training of nurses. The question is, why the assessment is required? Then we process to clinical interviews of the elderly person and to an assessment using simple standardized tests. After that, results are shared with the main care provider. Also, neuro neuropsychological evaluation are used for research in epidemiology and follow a specific pattern. First, we need the opinion of practitioners to eliminate contraindication. Then, we write a letter to inform the elderly person taking part in the research and his informant explaining why the study is carried out. Finally, a cognitive assessment is done that can be linked to factor of risk and protection. The most practical way to carry out a neuropsychological assessment with the elderly is to use a decisional tree with minimal state examination. If minimal state examination is greater than 17, we, then we perform a complete battery of tests for example, in France, for memory, we use 16 words of the free, free and cute selective remaining test called FC, R, FC, <laughs> SRT. For executive function, we use tray making test A and B. For visual constructive capacity, we use clock drawing test. For language, we use a French picture naming test called DO80 and lexical evocation. And for reasoning, we use similarity subtests of the vice three. After performing this battery of tests, we assess depression using geriatric depression scale, 15 items called GDS. If minimal state examination is between 10 and 17, we use 
most simple standardized tests. In France, we use generally BEC 9060 by Signore, which assess orientation, memory, executive function, and visual language and visual constructive capacities. If many mental state examination is smaller than 10, uh, generally no more tests are necessary. Uh, we are uh, in case with the severe dementia. In uh, all cases, we must evaluate autonomy. We use generally four instrumental activity of daily living called IADL. One, ability to use telephone. Two, mode of transportation. Three, responsibility for own medications. Four, ability to handle finances. With neuro... <laughs> Sorry. Um, for some patients with high sociocultural level, we use vice free, which is very complete battery standardized with sociocultural level. With neuropsychological evaluation, we try to set and to manage goals for patients with cognitive complaint. For all patients with a cognitive complaint, we have three main goals. One, maintaining function and independence. Two, preventing further cognitive decline. Three, ensuring quality of life. First, firstly, uh, for subjects with cognitive complaint, with cognitive impairment, this subject uh, have no trouble in battery of tests and no trouble in autonomy. Uh, Sometimes a depression uh, is a, it's a depression. Uh, who is uh, responsible 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 of uh, of the trouble of memory? For this patient, the goals are reassurance, optimizing management of comorbidities, promoting a healthy lifestyle. However, they should be monitored carefully for any sign of progression predictive or future mild cognitive impairment. Secondly, mild cognitive impairment or MCI. An important goal to, uh, for this patient, um, uh, battery of test begin to be altered, but autonomy is saved. An important goal to achieve is accepting the uncertainty surrounding this diagnosis, given the possibility of either progression or stability or even improvement. Other goals to consider as well are optimizing management of comorbidities and especially treat vas vascular risk factors, minimizing medication effective cognitive functions, promoting physical and mental health, building a partnership with patient and caregiver to establish a safety net and advanced care planning. Then for patients with dementia, for this patient, uh, but, uh, tests are altered and autonomy is altered too. Caregiver support becomes increasingly, increasingly important as disease progresses and dependence increases. Vigilance and early intervention for neuropsychiatric symptoms, sleep disturbance and incontinence. Meeting patients' goals for end-of-life care. Once the diagnosis is established, medication exists for dementia. I think you know about them, but I would like to mention as well non-pharmacological strategy. To date, no non-pharmacologic intervention has been shown to prevent further decline in patients with either subjective cognitive impairment or mild cognitive impairment. On the other hand, numerous non-pharmacologic interventions targeting patients with dementia the caregiver or the patient caregiver diet have been investigated. Firstly, physical exercises. Possible mechanisms by which exercises may improve or maintain cognitive function include improving central adiposity and insulin resistance, 
decreasing oxidative stress, improving vascular function, increasing cerebral blood flow. Secondly, cognitive stimulation. Cognitive stimulation uses enjoyable activities to engage memory and concentration in the social setting. Two of the larger studies using this approach reported improvement in cognitive function and quality of life, but not in functional status, mood, or behavioral symptoms. Thirdly, cognitive training. To date, brain training program have not provided a strong evidence of benefit on cognition, function, or mood in patients with mild to moderate dementia. Patients and caregivers should be cautioned against expensive programs that promise to prevent or reverse dementia. And finally, cognitive reframing for carers. It's a component of cognitive behavioral therapy, CBT. It focuses on caregivers' maladaptive, self-defeating or distressing cognition about their relative behavior. It focuses also on their own performance in the caring world. In conclusion, uh, I can say that neuropsychological eva evaluation is very useful to help doing diagnosis as precisely as possible in Alzheimer's disease and relative disorders. But to date, there are too few studies to show how to treat patients with MCI diagnosis and subjective cognitive impairment. So preventing Alzheimer's disease and relative disorders is almost impossible. My acknowledgement for Dr. Petitjean, who is psychiatrist, and Christophe Trival, who is geriatrician. Thank you. Very interesting talk. Any questions for Dr. Lacoste? I, I have uh, one. In my experience, when people, they ask me what I do, uh, and I tell them I, I work on neurobiology, dementia, Alzheimer's disease, the first question I always get asked is what can I do to not get that? What can I do to help it? As I'm sure everyone in the room gets asked that same question. And I noticed you mentioned in your non-pharmacological uh, list there, you mentioned exercise and cognitive function, thinking, using your brain. Yes. What about diet? What are your thoughts on diet? Uh, diet? Uh, yeah, what, what you eat, what you take uh, Nutrition? Nutrition. Uh, yes, uh, in epidemiology, there are studies uh, are done um, to, it's a factor of protection. Epidemi uh, research in epidemiology want to see that uh, um, nutrition is a factor of protection uh, of uh, of cognitive disorder for the elderly, but it's not very sure. I think, okay. but uh, it's uh, it's explore. <laughs> okay, those are the three things I tell everybody: <laughs> exercise, eat well, and think. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, I, you can, uh, I don't understand. Yes. Uh, the, if you use different uh, compounds, like those found in green tea, that have been found to aid uh, cognition and everything, what about those? Is that? If you, if you. Green tea. Green tea. Green tea. Yes, green tea. Has compounds in it that have been found uh, perhaps I don't know. Perhaps I okay. don't know. I don't know. It's uh, nutrition and condition is very. Uh, it's a subject uh, can be a subject with treat by himself <laughs> by itself. Okay. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much. Dr. Thank you. Uh, here.